Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the show. Fernando? Welcome to the show. Eating breakfast? Yeah. What do we have today? Uh, just eggs, egg and cheese. Panera's? Panera's. He loves Panera's. With Valentina. Well, of course. Silly me. What we have today is a Daewoo. I know, it's it's a car. It's a cute one. It's the little tiny two-door, like, ultimate teenage vehicle, first car thing. That's not important. What we're putting in it is one of the new Kenwood radios that just came out. Thought this would give us an opportunity to talk about it, as well as put a cool radio in a car. Without further ado, you ready, Fernando? Ready, let's go. Let's get going. Taking a look real quick at what we're putting in is this guy, the DMX 4707S. This is a new line of, I'm gonna say, affordable Android Auto, Apple CarPlay radios that Kenwood has just come out with this year. They have a version like this, which is mechaless, and they have another version that has a CD player. Both ultra affordable radios, which is perfect for this install. We're also gonna need a couple parts. BK SUX, SUX. Isn't that a Robocop thing? Anyways, K492 dash kit, which is a universal dash kit for these cars. The USB DMA1, little nickel USB. The wiring harness, BHA7200, we hope. With every dash kit, inside is an instruction manual. This is helpful because it shows you how to get the dash apart, of course, how to build the kit. In this case, it's a universal kit, so it's gonna have a lot of these little arms, which one needs to get broken off. Open this up and find our car. We have the Daewoo. It's simple enough. Let's hop in the car and we'll read through this. This is our dash. According to the instructions, it says carefully on snap, trim from around radio and remove. Carefully remove two Phillips screws securing the radio to the dash. Remove the radio from the dash cavity. Disconnect all harnesses, antenna, and remove radio. Seems pretty straightforward. I mean, it just has what looks like a little U trim piece around it that is already kind of loose. Service Bolton, anytime you're working on an older vehicle like this, always look around. You have crack here, you have crack here. There's cracks all along the dash here. This visor no longer does what it's supposed to do. It's just kind of like, wee. This is going to be super fragile, even though it's something simple that just on snaps. Always take your time and go very slow. Be super observant about the car. Look around at everything. These are clear indications that more than likely this plastic has seen better days. You can also get a hint too because it's super shiny, which means someone has put armor all on it, which also adds to these cracks and doesn't help matters much. We will grab our plastic pry tool. As you just heard, it is not liking this, but it did not crack. I will hold this corner here. See if that little cup holder comes out. There you go, you might be able to just get on, pull, push it back forward some and try to get it now, just you know, like this. So luckily the only thing that happened here was these little metal clips all just popped off and fell into the dash. It did not break. Just locate all these little metal clips. Here they are. We'll snap those back in place. Just like it said, there's two screws holding it in the radio and two screws holding the pocket. We're putting a double din in, so we will remove both. Slide the radio out. And we're done with this. We're not going to be using it for our kit. What we need to check, though, is our harness to make sure we have the right harness. Another PSA, as it were. Any time that I wire a radio up on the bench that I haven't pulled the radio out yet, it never fails. It's the wrong damn harness. Never fails. I don't even know why, after 30 years of doing this, I would even attempt to do it. But every now and then, you feel like, I'm going to chance it. Stupid move. Always get the radio out. Make sure you have the right harness before you wire it up. In this case, we are in luck. This harness plugs right in. Do a check. This is something a lot of people don't do and we get people that call all the time or they'll stop back in and they'll be like, hey, this doesn't work. What we're checking here is both sides of the wiring harness, our side and their side to see if there's wires on both sides. In this case, the blue wire, which could be an amp turn on or a power antenna, there's nothing on this side. So there's no point in us hooking this up. There's nothing there. We could just remove this wire 
water entirely from the harness. The one nice thing about doing this is if you are having to do something like steering wheel controls or backup camera or anything like that that may require an extra wire in the harness, by checking to see which harnesses are front and back, if we need to do steering wheel controls, it would still be in this harness. We could use this wire, repin it to a different location so we don't have to cut this side of the harness. We're all good? Yeah, all good. The other reason why doing that is super important, especially in a more modern vehicle, is the red accessory wire. Going forward now, most cars don't have the red accessory wire. They need a smart harness. But there are usually harnesses that look just like they'll plug right in, but they won't have the smart brain box attached to it. So they'll buy the cheap harness because they don't want to spend the money on the more expensive one for whatever reason. And they'll plug it in and then they'll call or they'll stop by and say, my radio doesn't turn on. That's because it doesn't have an accessory. You needed a smart harness. Well, they sold me the, you know, and then you have to go through that whole thing, which is just like, oh, come on, really? We're good here. The biggest thing we're gonna have to do on this one is figure out where we're going to put our USB, because it's not gonna go anywhere in the dash. He has the one cigarette lighter, but we have all this space along here. So we might be able just to drill a hole and snap it into our location. Problem is that the Kenwood radio has an attached USB. We have to snake it down around. So for service wise, if we just go with the short one footer, that would probably be a bad idea. Pack does make a three foot version of it, which we do stock. We end up going in the center console. More than likely, we're gonna go grab the three footer so that we can run it up behind the radio and attach it there. Let's head over to the bench and take a look at this new Kenwood radio. If you've ever put a Kenwood in before, you're gonna notice the packaging on this is gonna be a little bit different. They now have this white box here that has all the parts in it. We'll call this the part box. And the radio's in these two big pieces of foam. Typically Kenwoods don't come packaged this way. Does come with cage if you're doing something that requires one. And it also comes with a trim ring for that cage mount. You get the Bluetooth microphone. This does not look like a standard Kenwood microphone. It has the same end that a Kenwood normally has. However, it does have this loop style connector with a ball mount and a squishy end. But this will still go where we want it, which is up by the rear view mirror. It also comes with a flat mount. If you want to screw it down to something, you can. Set of extraction keys for the cage. Two bags of machined screws. One one for a flush mount and one V-cut. In the owner's manual bag is the warranty card as well as a removal tool for the faceplate, the harness itself, and the extension for the emergency brake wire. If you have an older Kenwood and like to replace it with this radio, the harness is different. This is a new harness that Kenwood is using on these radios. They do look exactly like the German harness that you would have factory in a German car. It will not be a direct plug-in to an older or existing harness. The only two harnesses that we've seen have this on the Kenwood are this one and of course the CD player version of it. Let's take a look at the back of the radio. In the top left corner, you'll see the blue yellow steering wheel control wire and it comes capped with a piece of heat shrink. Next to that is the purple white reverse trigger input because this will work a backup camera. And then the light green emergency brake wire, it has an end on it that will attach to this. How does emergency brake work? Is it the same as previous Kenwoods? And the answer is yes. It's identical to how Kenwood has always done it. The plug inputs are here. The one thing we've noticed, which we feel going forward in the future, is because it is a speaker harness and a power harness that plug in independent of one another, if you're doing an amplified system, I feel like a lot of shops may not plug this in, which isn't the end of the world because this is a fairly available harness, not anything special. However, if you are are having one of these installed with an amplified system, you may want to make sure that they give you this harness. What we've been doing is just taping it up, capping these off, and plugging it in. That way down the road, if you decide you want to take the amplifiers out but leave the radio in and you need deck power, it's there. The preamp outputs are here and also here. These are laid out totally different than any other Kenwood has been in the past. If you notice, you have two whites, two reds, two yellows, which is odd. Normally it'd be white, red, white, red, white, red. What they've done is they've gone to an over under design. The first set here are rears. The second set here are fronts. You have your video output to feed a, another screen 
as it were, whatever, maybe a USB thumb drive with a video on it or something like that. And you have your reverse camera input. You have an AV in, so this does have an aux input, and the microphone goes here. They are the exact same size holes, so make sure you pay attention to that. The antenna plugs in, it is not a pigtail off the radio. Sirius XM or the SVX300 will plug into this input. It does have a cap over it, you remove it, you plug it in. If not, just leave the cap on. This black wire here, single, is the subwoofer output. And it has the attached USB cable, which is about three feet long. It has an end that covers it. As far as the front of the radio goes, it is a super clean, flat, sexy look. It does have a screen protector over it to prevent any form of scratching while being installed, which I really like. And the edge here is thicker than most. Now this is unique only to the Mechalus radio on the version with the CD. This is barely a 16th of an inch. So if you are doing a dash kit where you need the radio to stick out, let's say in like a Jeep or in this car, where you need some real estate here, definitely want to go with the Mechalus over the CD DVD version. On this side of the radio, you have your volume up and down home button, menu, and voice. When we get it into the car, we'll go over some of the basic features that it has. Suffice it to say, they are similar to all the other Kenwood radios. The operating system on this is a 100% standard Kenwood. Grabbing the pieces out of our kit, it too comes with screws. However, these are the coarse thread screws which are not made for a Kenwood. So set these aside, you won't be using these. This has a standard front trim piece. I always like to fit this over my radio to see how it is going to fit to make sure that it will go in and have a nice fit and sit flush with it. This fits really good. The other thing I like to do too is because this car obviously is not something we do daily, is make sure that this is the right trim for the front, specifically check the corners. Even though at first glance this kit looks like it's the same all the way around, it is not. It has rounded corners here in the bottom and square corners here in the top, and it does marriage up nice with this factory trim bezel. Now this does not come with a pocket, so it is not made for a single DIN. On the side of the kit, you'll notice these slits here and here. They match up with these two protrusions here and here. They do not lock in place. It just sits on top of it and we'll hold it once the radio goes in. And next, we need to break off the tabs we're not gonna be using for this install. In the instructions, it shows you grayed out area. All this grayed out area has to be removed. And then a half piece down here that need to remain. The rest needs to be sanded off. Previous videos, I've showed you different ways to do this. Some you can use flush cutters, duckbill pliers and break it off. On this kit, however, these are extra thick, which is kind of surprising. I'm gonna just use a grinder to get these off. When they're too thick, if you go to break them, it will actually break this back piece because these are thicker than the back piece. The one problem with sanding them off like that is that it does create a lot of debris in the holes that, that needs to go back and be removed. Easily enough though with a razor blade and the parts that you need to clean out, these grooves here where the screws are gonna go in. And then just make sure there's nothing on the back side where it's gonna sit up flush against the radio. Sand this end down so that it just looks like a thinner tab. Test fit it in the car to make sure that you have it the way you want it. This piece here is what we have to clear. That seems to be just the way we want it. We'll do the same same thing to the other side. Push both sides in, let it set onto the counter like this. Bring your radio up from the back side, slowly push it into place. Once it's pushed in, it'll lock these two sides in. Turn it on its side. Get your depth just right so that it looks the way you want. In this case, we can go for a really nice flush look. I like to try to get a screw into each side. Check your gapping, check your spacing, check, make sure it's straight, just take a look at it. In this case, we can put this in front of it and see how that looks, looks good. We do have this little screen protector. Wanna make sure we pull it out so that you can get to it. This part of the radio is done. Let's take a look at the harness. Believe it or not, there's standard coloring that gets used in car audio, for the most part. There are a few exceptions to the rules. Most manufacturers stick to them. Alpine being one that tends to vary on their orange white wire, but we don't have an Alpine, we have a Kenwood. Let's take a look at what this plug has and explain what each wire does. On the white plug, this is your speaker plug. You have green, white, gray, purple, solid, and with a black stripe. The black stripes are all gonna be negative. They go to assigned corners. White is driver's front, gray is passenger front, green is driver's rear, purple is passenger rear. On the power side, yellow is constant 12 volts, black is ground, red is an accessory turn on, 
Blue is going to be amplifier turn on or amplified antenna turn on. And the orange wire is going to be illumination. On the harness we're gonna be using, they use the exact same color patterns. They have white here, green. On the other side, they have gray and the purple. In the middle, we have our yellow constant 12 volts, our black ground, our orange illumination, our red accessory. In the middle, we have a blue white and a blue. Blue white was the wire that was not pinned on the other side. The blue, however, is the difference between a blue and a blue white. In the harness here, the blue white is an amplifier turn on. If it has a white stripe, that's primarily what it's for. The blue is an amplified antenna turn on. This is what gives you FM. A lot of questions we get is why does my FM suck? The first question I ask is did you hook up the blue wire? Because if you didn't, that amplifier that turns on is is not getting power. This is kind of loose because not all manufacturers use blue, white, or blue to denote one or the other. Sometimes they just use one blue wire for an amplifier and antenna turn on, or they use one blue, white to do the same thing. Either way, if it has it, hook it up. If it's a blue wire, I recommend connecting it to the accessory to turn on that amplified antenna. The reason why is some cases this output here, this does not provide enough amperage to power what this is going to draw. Connecting it to the accessory will allow it to turn on and off with the car and give you no issues. All we have to do at this point is connect these wires together, matching color for color, and we'll be in business. The harness is all set, plugged into the back of the radio. I also zip tied up all the extra wiring that's not gonna be used across the top here out of the way. The only thing hanging down is the USB. Fernando located the USB right here. We kept the smaller one because it's easy enough to just reach behind there and plug it in. The Bluetooth mic went up by the mirror. It clipped into place fairly easily. We run the wire across here, down the A pillar. We loom it and bring it into the dash. Plug the radio in now, screw back into place, and see if it works. How you want to do this is work with the longest wires to the shortest wires. Don't plug the shortest wires in first, then you won't be able to get everything else plugged in. Tuck your wires into the dash, slide it into place. At this point, we want to power the radio up, test the USB, the microphone, and all those fun things before we screw it all back together. Now like all previous model Kenwoods, it has the setup page, clock adjust, you set your date, month, and year, your time, and then when you're done, make sure you hit the set button. You also have your choice of languages, display type. This one, you can import two of your own images or pick a background that they already have. Camera, it has parking guidelines on and off. Default is on, demo, cancel demo, hit finished. We should have sound now test our car play. What's the weather like today? It's currently clear. That's what we want to check. That tells us a bunch of things. It tells us our mic works. It tells us it's communicating properly. It's all good there. The USB is working. We're going to screw this into the dash and then we'll take a look at some more features that this radio has built into it. For the most part, it looks just like a standard Kenwood radio. If you hit the nine key, it pulls up your sources. We have radio, the option for Sirius XM, Bluetooth, USB, aux input, and standby. The gear is located here to get into the menus. If you'd like like to move the icons around, press and hold, slide them into place, select the gear. You have setup and you have and your audio setup, your crossover selection, your 13 band equalizer. You have presets as well as three user presets. And of course you'd select all source. This has source tone adjust so you can have different EQ settings for all your different sources. It has basic time alignment, balance and fader, volume offset so that you can match all your volume levels. It also has basic sound effects such as bass boost and loudness. In your basic setup menu, you have your AV setup for CarPlay, whether you want it left or right. The Blay has your dimmer setting, screen adjustment for colors, your background imagery, user interface. This is where you can turn your beep on and off, select your language, your time format, and adjusting the clock. Camera features. Special features are where the demo on and off are, your software information, as well as resetting the radio or initialize. Bluetooth settings. You can change the name, change the pin. And that's it on the back end side of things. It's a rather nice looking basic radio for sure. If you're looking for something that'll do Android Auto and Apple CarPlay that won't break the bank but still has that nice Kenwood interface, definitely something to take a look at. And if you have a Daewoo, now you know how to put it in your car. How exciting is that? All right, Fernando, that brings us to the end of the show. Thank you guys so much for watching as always. On to the next one, guys. You guys have a nice night as always. We'll see you later next time. Bye. Bye. Bye.